everyone. Thank you for being with us today for this second session of the Daylight Awareness Week 2022. I'm Lydia Moreno, the program manager of the Daylight Academy, which is behind this event. And I am very happy to welcome you to this second part of our scientific journey around sunlight and its effects. The journey started already yesterday. Um, we had the opportunity to take a closer look at the sun and at some of its mysteries uh, together with an astrophysicist. Then we learned about the processes of global dimming and brightening that affect sunlight in our atmosphere, atmosphere on its way to Earth. And finally, we had a fascinating insights into um, archaeoastronomy, which is a discipline that studies how astronomy and particularly the sun influenced ancient cultures and their architecture. Today, we are back on Earth and we will explore different roles and uses of daylight in our direct environment together with a multidisciplinary panel of experts. They will be, they will be presented in a few moments, but before handing over to them, I would like to say a few words about the Delight Academy for those who are joining us for the first time. So the Delight Academy is an international membership organization that connects scientists with very different backgrounds, architects, engineers, artists, and many other professionals involved in daylight research or particularly interested in such topics. It is a project of the Velux Stiftung, which is a foundation based in Switzerland that supports scientific research internationally. And in, a, in addition to bringing all these expert, experts together in an interdisciplinary way, the Daylight Academy also wants to share scientific knowledge with the public and create more awareness about the benefits of daylight. And that's why we organize this Daylight Awareness Week which is this year also to celebrate the UNESCO International Day of Light, which takes place uh, in five days on, on May 16. Let me also show you the amazing team that is working in the background and making sure that uh, we can enjoy this webinar in the best possible way. By the way, if you have any technical issue, please don't hesitate to tell us through the chat and we will be happy to help you as much as we can. And of course, you are also very welcome to use the chat to share your thoughts or to uh, interact with the other participants. I also would like to mention Marina Roa that you see here on the top. Uh, she is from SenseDrive, a consulting organization that is supporting us with this event. And she will be doing live illustration during the whole session. She will be capturing the, the highlights of our discussions in a nice visual way. And she will also show us some of her drawings at the end. Finally, please note that the webinar is being recorded and uh, that the video will be available on the Delight Academy website uh, afterwards. So that's all for my introduction. Now I'm happy to leave room for the experts. And first for our moderator, Jean-Louis Scartezzini. Jean-Louis is professor at the Solar Energy and Building Physics Laboratory at the EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. And he's also past speaker of the Daylight Academy Steering Committee. Jean-Louis, it's an honor to have you facilitating this discussion. Please, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Lydia. Welcome, uh, we'd like to welcome everybody to the second day of the Daylight Awareness Week. The topic, as Lydia said, is sunlight on hers today. I will hide a little bit in the dark, but still the reason is, you can see me on the screen, the reason is that daylight will probably come in a while and that the speakers of today will be under the the uh, light projector, the, the, the light themselves. So today, uh, as mentioned, uh, sunlight on Earth, uh, as uh, the journey through space, sunlight is now arriving on Earth. We all know that uh, in addition to illumination and warming, daylight plays a multitude of essential role in our direct environment. It's also uh, thanks to light, to the sunlight that uh, living being can 
can can be on Earth, and without this energy, this solar energy, we would not be here today, uh, this evening or this morning uh, on the screen. So first, uh, it's a powerful source of renewable energy uh, whose potential is not yet fully exploited. And Professor Richard Perez, who would be the first speaker uh, in, a, in a while from uh, uh, State University of New York, will uh, present us, will explain us uh, why technology, which is constantly evolving to make most of the sun energy, and uh, will explain us how powerful this uh, renewable and solar energy can be. So he will be the first speaker, uh, I would say this morning or this afternoon or this, this evening, depending from where you are. Uh, then something we should not forget is that plants are experts uh, and, and make an optimal use of solar energy on the earth to produce food. And from this food, animals can live and we can live from, from plants and for some of us from animals. And so uh, you will get the second contribution of this session, which will be dedicated to the role of daylight in forest ecology. And this will be presented by Professor Harald Brugman, Brugman sorry, from the Forest Ecology Department of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, the so-called ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Finally, our stopover on Earth will also be an opportunity to reflect the use of daylight in buildings. Uh, this can affect our physiology, our psychology, health, comfort, behavior, economics, and all the uh, lighting environment in building. And this will be the topic and the, the, uh, the reason of the presentation, the topic of the presentation of Professor Marlene Anderson from the Sustainable Architecture and, De and Delighting Strategy from the so-called Lippi Lab. I will have more time to present our speaker. But Marlene Anderson is uh, from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, in Switzerland. So this is very briefly our program um, uh, for this uh, session. Uh, I have something to let you know that uh, I'm sure that many of you, and I hope so, they will have a lot of questions to, to ask to the, the three speakers uh, during, uh, today. But uh, the, we are organized so that there will be breakout rooms three breakout rooms for the participant, for our people, to ask the questions to the speakers. So again, in order to, for reason of time, there will be not time for questions during the presentation or after the presentation, but a lot of time in the breakout room, in the three breakout rooms to which the speaker will participate. So here we are at the beginning of uh, the presentation by the three speakers. And uh, again, I would like to, introduce the first speaker, Professor Richard Perez, who will present and, and, uh, as a main topic, we'll talk about renewable and solar energy, actually on Earth. Richard Perez is a senior research associate in atmospheric science a research center from State University of New York in Albany. Uh, he is uh, again uh, active in the direct application of solar energy and teaches these fields in uh, regarding solar radiation and solar energy application in this university. He is well known in the field of solar energy. I can even say that I know him to probably since 30, 35 years for the development of solar radiation models and which are used all over the world and incorporated in standard solar energy and daylight in calculation model. And again, as I said, most uh, in many universities, many places around the world. He is also, he produced more than 200 journal articles, conference papers, technical report, a very active person. And receive, and receive several international awards. And I don't have unfortunately the time to present all of them, but the list is very long. So again, the floor is yours, Richard, if you want to begin with your presentation, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope everybody can see my screen. Good morning, evening or, or day, wherever you are on the planet. So I will be talking about energy today, daylight energy. And if you will, we'll move beyond the visible light and claim the entire solar spectrum from the ultraviolet to the infrared. That's the energy. And we'll call it solar energy because that's what um, that's the, the going word in, in the business. So I would like to stress three points today. First, that the resource, solar energy, is a big resource. That it is an inexpensive resource. And finally, that it is a 
24 365 resource, something that can be used at night and in winter when apparently there is no sun. So big first. So here, each, each sphere, the surface of each sphere represents the amount of energy available on planet Earth. So on the bottom left, you have the energy consumed by the, by the planet. This is what all the economies of the world use. And on the right, you have the finite resource. So that's if you use them once, you lose them. So they are rather big compared to what we use, coal, uranium, petroleum, natural gas. On the left, you have all the renewables. And in the center, you have the amount of solar energy hitting planet Earth per year. So it doesn't even compare with anything else. It's much, much bigger than the finite and all the renewables combined. So it looks like this is a resource that we can really work with. If you, if I put here the consumption and the resource together. And the instruments to utilize that resource uh, more and more is photovoltaic power generation, direct conversion of sunlight into electricity. And that technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. This is the tracing the price of a turnkey utility scale photovoltaic power plant since I began working in the mid eighties to today. And it's going to get even cheaper in the future. The technology is getting better. There is more of it produced. The markets are growing. So it's hundred times cheaper already than it was. And it's gonna go down another factor of 10. Uh, that's a diagram I like to look. It's, it's uh, every year Lazard Bank publishes, compares all the energy generating resources available to the economy. And on the x-axis, you have the unsubsidized cost per megawatt hour to produce uh, electricity. More familiar, you divide by 10 and you have the cost per kilowatt hour, which would be on your electric bill of everything that generates power. So here is the utility scale solar. You can see it's to the, to the left. I draw a line through that to compare better to everything else. And these are the coal, nuclear, and gas. And you can see it's already considerably cheaper today than all the, the legacy technologies that are driving the economy today. That's for new built construction, and it's pretty much on par with plants which are fully depreciated and operating. So it's about the same price as operating a nuclear power plant that's been uh, operating 30 years. So keep the old clunker on, but please don't build new ones because it doesn't even make sense financially, uh, not even talking about environmental problem. Interestingly, this is the price of offshore wind and it's quite a bit uh, more expensive than solar already today. And we are not done yet. It's gonna get cheaper. Uh, Lazard Bank, Bloomberg, all the, all the big uh, business that follow that on, 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 the, on the planet assume that it's gonna be about here by 2035 and even lower by 2050. And on the other hand, the legacy technologies are going to get more expensive because today, we are not paying, these are unsubsidized prices and they're not accounting for all the environmental and strategic externalities that these technologies carries. As we can see today with the, the price of gas in Europe, that's a strategic externality. The, the price on the network in uh, European network is close to 25 cents per kilowatt hour today, just because of that strategic uh, issue that we are having with Ukraine. Uh, how about 24, 365? So that's, that's a real issue because PV, solar is intermittent. As people say, there is nothing at night. And this is a typical day's output. So it's sunny in the morning, the sun goes up, and then there are a bunch of clouds in the day, then a big cloud in the afternoon, and then it disappears again. And that's what's needed on the power grid, something that's firm and dispatchable. So it doesn't look... Uh, pretty much the same. And some of you may have heard of those duck curves that are uh, increasingly encroaching on utility uh, demand curves. This is a California problem initially, but it's a problem appearing all over the planet. You put more PV 
on user side on houses and then you have create a hole in the demand of the utilities that they have to fill with something and then you have a huge ramp towards the evening and that's only the tip of the iceberg this is what happens within a day the much bigger problem for firm power generation is multi-day and seasonal so this is the production of photovoltaic plant in my neck of the woods in in upstate new york and there are big holes as you can see there is uh, like two weeks three weeks period with almost no output and what i need is on the right that's the load i need to fill on the right so how do you do that well energy storage is on everybody's mind short term middle term long term energy storage and physically it works when you have excess you put it into storage and when you don't have enough you take it back from storage there is one big problem with that whereas the the run of the weather photovoltaic is getting very cheap that's the I'm pricing the cost of electricity on that axis on that scale here firming it up 24 365 with storage only would cost uh, very very much it would be almost unaffordable almost 20 times more in that example unless uh, you do something that has been totally uh, counterintuitive up to today, that's almost an anathema, but it's catching up rather fast. You build more solar than you need, and by design, you're going to waste some of it, you're going to curtail some of it. And when you do that, something really interesting happens. So the white line is the cost of firm 24, 365 electricity. The red line is the contribution of solar, so it goes up because you overbuild and you don't monetize everything. But you can see the blue line that represents what you have to pay for energy storage goes way, way down until you reach a point where it's almost affordable. It's, it's pretty close to, to making sense today. In fact, you will see a couple of results in a minute. And that technique is so effective that we stopped calling it overbuilding, curtail. We call it implicit storage because overbuilding solar just makes it's a catalyst to to batteries and to other forms of storage makes it works much much better to deliver the same thing that you need in, and the specialized press is catching up quite on it that's quartz business magazine quoting us solar energy is so cheap that it can be wasted i should have said it must be wasted to be to be cheap and these are some key results we have uh, in the central us in the great plains we have a mix of 55% photovoltaics, 5% e-fuel, solar e-fuels, and 40% wind could deliver by 2040 five cents per kilowatt hour for 24, 365 electricity forever. So cheap power, as much as you need for as long as the eye can see. This is a study we are just finishing for Switzerland here for the, for the Federal Office of Energy working with Meteo Test in, uh, in Bern. This is, these are the results we get, 45% PV, 15% solar e-fuels, and 40% hydro, entirely getting rid of the current nuclear uh, generation in Switzerland at 7.5 cents per kilowatt hour in Switzerland. Also, as far as the eye can see, 24, 365 power. So 7.5 cents is about three times cheaper than the, the power exchange today on the on the transmission system operator because of the issues with uh, with Eastern European gas. So I hope you will uh, remember those three big attributes to daylight solar energy. It's very big. There is much more than we need to do everything and more. It's getting inexpensive and it's something that can work 24, 365, not only when the sun shines or not only when the wind blows. It's something that's designed to work all the time if, if well designed. And I'll thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions in, later on. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Teras, for your presentation. Very enlightening. Any on time, uh, as uh, I had to probably forget to say for the other speaker that uh, they should limit their time to 10 minute presentation, but there will be plenty of time in the breakout room to ask questions and, and discuss topic. I would like to introduce the second speaker uh, today, this morning, this afternoon, or this night, Professor Harald Buchmann. Uh, he will entertain us, present us uh, the topic of forest ecology. He is full professor at of forest ecology at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich the so-called ETH Zurich. Uh, he uh, 
uh, carried out a thesis there uh, dealing with the impact of climate change on mountain forests in the Alps. So this was already in 1994, so very early time. His main interest in research are the long-term dynamics of forest ecosystems <coughs> under environmental changes and the dynamics in mountain forests. And uh, he was last but not least contributor of and reviewer of the second, third, and fourth assessment reports of the third governmental panel on climate change, the so-called IPCC. So, Professor Arabuman, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction. You can see my slides and you can hear me. Okay, very good. So, welcome to my talk on the role of light in forest ecology. As a matter of fact, you know, in such a short presentation, I can only address a few aspects of the role of light in forests, but you can always ask questions afterwards in the breakout session. Now, in photovoltaics, the more light there is, the more energy one can produce with a solar panel, as we have just heard. For example, the higher the light intensity, the higher the efficiency of the panel. And note that a thousand watts per square meter given here on the x-axis is bright sunshine. And hence, indeed, the more light, the better. Now, forests are the photovoltaic plants of nature and light availability determines their efficiency as well. Forests turn light energy into stored carbon, into timber to build houses, or into smaller pieces of wood that can be used as bioenergy to name just a few of the many services provided by forests to human societies. Now, when looking at the response curve of net photosynthesis to light at the leaf level, it also appears true that the more light there is, the more power you can get, like in photovoltaics. But what is happening not at the cell scale, but at the ecosystem scale? When we look at the development of a forest after the retreat of a glacier, for example, we can see that at the beginning of this so-called succession, light demanding trees such as larch are abundant. They do not tolerate a lot of shade. Over time, a very mixed community composed of many tree species develops, but eventually one or just a few tree species come to dominate that tolerate the low light levels quite well. And hence, they outcompete all other species. One of these species that dominates is beech, shown here on the right. Thus, forests regulate light availability as an internal feedback. And it appears indeed that more light is beneficial for tree growth and species diversity. As a matter of fact, some forest management practices, for example, in Switzerland and elsewhere in Europe, aim to reduce competition for light by creating light forests, Lichterwald in German, which enhances the coexistence of multiple tree species with many wildflowers and other species, also animals. But it's not so simple. Let me take you to the subalpine zone to about 1800 meters above the sea level in the Surselva, where there is one of the last remaining primeval forests of Switzerland. It is dominated by Norway spruce, and under natural conditions, also rowan would play an important role. However, rowan currently has a very hard time due to the high abundance of ungulates, such as chamois. In these high elevation forests, which are characterized by a cold and snow rich climate, so-called nurse logs play an important role for the regeneration of Norway spruce trees. Why is this so? On such a log, seedlings and saplings of Norway spruce experience little competition with grasses and forbs from the forest floor. Also, at these elevated positions, they experience less snow cover, which thus leads to an extended growing season. This is quite important in this cold climate where growing season is very short. And lastly, chamois and deer have a harder time to get to these small trees as they are simply less accessible at elevated positions. Two of these factors are clearly related to light availability. Hence, the higher light availability of nurse logs must be conducive to their establishment and growth. 
However, again, it's not that simple. Sure, a seed can germinate and grow to a seedling like this one here on virtually any nurse log. However, on a freshly fallen log like the one in the foreground, the seedling will not survive because it cannot grow roots into the still very hard wood. Thus, the lying log needs to decay for some time before it is suitable for tree, tree, tree regeneration, as such as the, the log shown in the background. And obviously, if logs are hanging high up in the sky, like this one, this is not a great place for regeneration to be either. But don't take this too seriously. Now, look at the log here. I tried to advance, but this does not work. Oops. OK, now look at this log here. In the background, near the next living tree, it is too dark. So we understand why trees cannot grow there. It's simply not enough light. In the foreground, there is enough light, and hence we can find tree regeneration there. Good. But what is happening in the middle of this small forest gap where light availability is highest? Why is there no tree regeneration here on the log? This has to do with the fact that light energy is not only driving photosynthesis, but it also leads to the evaporation of water. And if there is a lot of evaporation, the stem will dry out and it is becoming too dry for trees to establish and grow. This is similar to the situation when you wash your hair and use a hair dryer afterwards. The hot air is first used to, ev to evaporate the water on your head. And only once this water is gone, the hair dryer will start to heat and if you don't pay attention, eventually burn your skin. Scientifically speaking, we say that the energy is first going into so-called latent energy, that is evaporation, and only after all the water is gone, the energy is going into the so-called sensible heat flux, that is, it leads to higher temperature. Hence, there is a strong interaction between light and moisture, and a lot of light energy can lead to a drying out of the rooting zone of trees. Thus, it is not always true that the more light the better for the trees. Now, so far, I have only talked about the amount of light, that is light quantity. However, the quality of light, that is its spectral composition, is also very important in forests. I would like to illustrate this with just one example because time is so limited. Trees like the one in the middle can sense from the spectral composition of the light that is coming to them from the different directions, whether it is from a rock, which is not threatening their existence, or from a competing tree. Hence, shade cast by a rock and shade cast by a neighboring tree are not the same for our target tree, and the tree can adjust its growth strategy accordingly. For example, if the tree in the center is not shade tolerant, it will not grow towards a competing neighbor on the right, but it will grow towards the rock. So you see, the role of light in forests is quite complex. Undisputedly, light is what drives all biological processes by providing energy. Light availability also drives forest succession and intermediate light levels are conducive to a high plant diversity. But high light levels can also lead to moisture stress. So it is the balance between light and moisture availability that determines many ecological processes. In science, we are far from having understood all aspects of forests in their fascinating complexity, and many mysteries remain. For you to enjoy when you take a walk in the forest, and for us to do research. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion in the breakout session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hugman, for this beautiful tour in the forest in a very short, limited opportunity time. And as you said, there will be time in the breakout rooms to ask you and uh, uh, ask you a lot of questions, I'm sure. I would like to introduce the third speakers of today, Professor Marilyn Anderson, who will, uh, his, her topic will be uh, sustainable architecture and daylighting strategies. Uh, Marilyn Anderson is a full professor of sustainable construction technology and former dean 
of the School of Architecture, Civil and Environmental Engineering of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, the so-called APFL. Uh, she's professor, she was professor, associate professor of building technology uh, at the MIT School of Architecture and Planning and heading the MIT Daylighting Lab before joining us. Uh, Madeleine Anderson research focuses on building performance in the architectural context in general and the use and optimization of daylight or daylighting in building in particular. And as uh, you can imagine, she's also teaching daylighting and building technology to our student. She's author of many papers. As all our speakers today, the recipient of several grants and awards. And uh, again, I'm sure that uh, you will appreciate uh, her presentation uh, in a couple of seconds. And as uh, said before to the other speakers, unfortunately, presentation limited to 10 minutes, but a lot of time for questions in the break after. Madeline, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Louis. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you here today to talk about light in different forms. Um, the way I would like to talk about it is as an experience, as a human experience, and not just as uh, something that gives us an amount of light, but also something that we enjoy, that keeps us connected to the outside, to weather, to time, that gets uh, beautiful patterns that we like to see around where we live, and that basically contributes to the life of our buildings from the inside as well. And so uh, the, one of the aspects of daylight uh, that is very crucial to our well-being is actually its contrast to the night. And when we think about uh, going further and further from the sky, which happens in deep uh, buildings, whether they are deep underground or deep in plan, uh, we get further from this uh, abundant and contrasted light source, which creates uh, some issues that we will talk about, um, given that indoor light is typically a hundred times dimmer than outdoor light. So what is what is it about daylight that we like to experience? When, when we see a, a picture like this, we can answer in many, many ways. It can be about the contrast, about the sunlight coming in, about the fact that we have view to the outside, about that we have a lot of light and, and we feel energized by this light. And indeed, these are all true answers. Um, how we are going to look at them uh, during this talk is mostly through two different perspectives, a perceptual one and a physiological one. And for that, we actually started by moving this building that was built in Florida to Reykjavik and then see how the experience would be uh, seen. And here you can see the same space over the same day, uh, the, the summer solstice, and how differently we can talk about it. We can talk about how much contrast there is and how much movement of light pattern there is. Or on the right, we can talk about it as how much of a potential it offers for our well being and health through a sufficient or insufficient exposure to light. And so we have just seen the summer solstice. Now we see the winter solstice, which in Reykjavik is pretty bad in terms of amount of light. And uh, the idea here is to show that we need both to have the, right, the light at the right time and to have a sufficient dose when it comes to physiology. So overall, uh, bringing this into an occupant perspective in a building, uh, again, there are many ways to look at it, but if we keep going along those two sort of uh, perspectives, um, and we take as the example, a, a building that was built in Toronto uh, that has a pretty nice uh, open space uh, that looks a bit like a donatorium, but is much more informal in its use and is actually very well uh, or very intensely daylit. Uh, we can take the position of someone in there and then start to look at, okay, how would that space be experienced, first of all, when it's sunny versus when it's cloudy? And how much can we talk about uh, what my light dose is and how the visual interest of that um, space varies? And so if we look around, uh, literally, uh, we can also see a, a variation of uh, the amount of contrast and what we associated with visual interest, uh, while uh, for a given moment we would have, uh, of course, a aesthetic light dose and therefore health potential. 
So on the perceptual aspect, for example, we can look further into what we call spatial contrast. So this combination of light and dark, and also the, 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 the change from light to dark uh, in any given area of the space. And so we, when we, you look at these masterpieces of architecture from the Institut du Monde Arabe by Jean Nouvel in Paris uh, through the Serpentine Pavilion, the Nagabao House that we have seen before, and then to a church which has a more subdued lighting, the First Unitarian Church, and then the Menil Gallery, all these masterpieces of architecture, you can see that obviously they have very, very different atmospheres, all of them a success, but different. And then we can start to feel, okay, how can we look at them? Well, we could look at this amount of local and global contrast and how it varies over time, which is something that we did in, in some of the research that we conducted a, a few years ago um, and where we looked at over entire year, so over all the days of the year and all the hours of the day, um, how much of that spatial contrast would happen depending on uh, what space we are looking at. We can also look at daylight patterns. And so here for a, a very boring space in this case, but the exact same amount of daylight, it's a 50% opening uh, ratio. So we have exactly the same amount of light. We can ask people how differently or not they would perceive this space and uh, associate adjectives to it. And very interestingly, this is not about brightness. It's not about preferring a brighter space. It's really about preferring a different pattern and maybe more organic one, a irregular one. And where you can see that uh, the percentage of people having positive reactions to the middle uh, situation was quite um, impressive, while all of them felt they had, they had the same satisfaction with the amount of view, which is a good sign because the view was all the time 50%. So if we push this uh, even a bit further, we actually um, conducted a series of experiments in three locations in Europe, in a very northern latitude in Norway, um, in Trondheim, in Switzerland, which was also quite practical. And the space you see here is actually a, a real space that we have on campus, although not with those patterns. And, uh, and then in Greece to see whether geographical location and, and maybe what you are used to and where you live plus um, other factors that might influence how you perceive a space would uh, influence what you would say about these. And quite interestingly, when you look at this, um, this, this space that was also looked at with other sun positions and with overcast skies and et cetera, et cetera, and with different furniture to give it a more work uh, context, we could see that we actually found, I mean, uh, relatively speaking, quite different reactions depending on whether we had, for example, a very regular, well-aligned uh, pattern versus a slightly skewed one. Uh, so one of the most exciting was the skewed one. One of the least exciting was rated uh, to be the vertical one, which tells us something about either our eagerness to be surprised or something else about uh, something about liking complexity or naturalness. This is all uh, ongoing work actually to find out more about what this means. On the other hand, uh, I talked about uh, the, the, the more physiological aspects and we have discovered, I mean, not we as a group, but the world, the world of neuroscientists have discovered uh, a long uh, forgotten uh, or overlooked, let's say, um, uh, photopigment in the ganglion cells of the, the, the eye, of the mammalian eye, not just the humans, very ancient photoreceptor actually, which is responsible to entrain our circadian rhythms and uh, get our clock aligned to, uh, to a 24 hour cycle. The IPRGCs, uh, also called the melanopsin photopigments, are there to help us regulate our bodies to the outside world through light. And this is what is very interesting about it is that it has a different sensitivity to color than, for example, the visual system or the cones and, uh, the cones and rods, and a higher sensitivity to the blue, which leads maybe many people to misinterpret blue as bad light. Blue is not a bad light. It depends when you get it. It's great to have a lot of blue in white light or another type of light in the morning, but not so much in the evening. So it's more the timing that matters because the uh, influence of light on our body is through the eye uh, going to regulate a lot of things, uh, a lot of hormones, um, the body temperature, 
our level of vigilance and attention. Melatonin, for example, which is probably a hormone that you know, uh, can only be produced in the absence of light and at night. So it has to have both conditions to be uh, actually produced. But what is it about light that really matters? Well, it looks like a lot of things actually matter when it comes to these effects. Uh, how much light, its wavelengths, duration, when we get the light and the history, so what we have been exposed to before. And of course, the contrast between light and dark. So there are a lot of questions that have been bringing even more questions. So it seems that higher levels are more effective to trigger that system and to give us this Zeitgeber, this, uh, this clock regulating um, factor, which is actually light. But now we understand that there is uh, actually a lot of interaction between the, the visual and so-called non-visual systems. We also understand that uh, blue light is maybe more effective, but because of this interaction, it might not be such a unilateral effect. Strangely, from an in intuition standpoint, uh, intermittent light seems to be quite effective in the sense that it keeps us stimulated on and off, even though we have evolved under continuous lighting. The timing matters a lot when we get the light and, of course, the adaptation to changes, which also uh, the circadian um, rhythms are actually also uh, dependent on other things than light, and therefore this is even more complex. But if we really try to simplify this into more of a dual aspect, it is a lot about what light you're exposed to and when you're exposed to it, uh, knowing that the uh, circadian system and circadian rhythms interact with the, this amount of light very much. So the same amount of light will have a different effect depending on the time of day. Now, uh, in our daily living, let's say, um, we uh, would look at uh, the ideal scenario being that we would live in the solar clock. We would sleep at night and be uh, uh, doing our things only during the day. Of course, the reality is we spend a lot of our time indoors in a dim environment, two dim environments, and we have a social life that makes our evenings very bright when we would actually need to diminish the light so as to have a good night's sleep and uh, get our immune system to be better, our mood, our sleep quality, etc. It gets even worse for shift workers, which have a totally shifted uh, clock compared to the solar one. And it wouldn't be so bad if they were able to live in bright environments during the night and in very dark environments during the day, but that means they have no social life. And I think that COVID has taught us or reminded us very strongly that we do need a social life and therefore it's impossible to live in this highly contrasted way. And third, last but not least, at least this is a trend that will start again, um, jet lag will be also affecting our circadian rhythms and our adjustment to the clock. And therefore it's becoming very important to know your own clock to be able to get the light when you actually need it and when you can help fight jet lag with it. In a summary, in a way, uh, there are many things that uh, impact our light exposure. And when we think about the built environment, First, there is the urban fabric that is the first filter of it. It's a filter through its density, the height of the buildings, the street width, the open space, um, and, and how much of them there are to, to offer to the city occupants. It's also through its architecture and building form, how many openings, what size, what orientation, what is the depth of the space. It's then also filtered through the envelope, what glazing, what shading, what window size and what controls. And finally, it's filtered, of course, by the occupant itself, by his or her behavior, but even also by the lens of his or her eye, which yellows with age. So all of these factors matter to, the, to how much light we need to feel good, and we actually don't know the answer right now. But we can already sort of summarize things in a, in a pretty basic way we need enough light in the morning and enough blue in there to get our, to reset our clock and to get our day to adjust to a 24 hour cycle rather than the average 24.3 that humans have. This is the morning. During midday, we typically would need just bright light. To the evening, we would try to limit light and therefore especially limit uh, the amount of blue light. And then at night, we should live in darkness, ideally, or actually close our eyes and sleep even better. And so an illustration of this, both on the city level and on the human level, is to ensure that mornings have this bright 
blue, blue rich light to get our biology clock to be synchronized uh, during midday. We have to be moving around and have intense uh, light to be alert. In the evening, we are talking about dimmer light with less blue, where the artificial um, lighting is a problem to solve uh, through our um, lifestyle, and that can create social jet lag, uh, so-called so social jet lag. I, I think this was um, named by uh, Till uh, a, a while ago. Um, and, uh, and then at night, of course, we need to reset our system, sleep, and be uh, in the dark so to make sure that melatonin is produced. So in a nutshell, this is what I wanted to share, both about the perceptual aspects of daylighting uh, through some of the research we are doing and through the physiological aspects of lighting, also through some of the work that we are doing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marilyn, for this third enlightening presentation, almost in time. Thank you very much for the participation. Thank you very much for being active uh, with the last two questions and for the questions to the different speakers. I would like to give the floor, uh, the words and the floor to Lydia Moreno for the last word, but without not forgetting to thank you very much for listening and being with us today. Lydia. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Thank you very much for your great moderation. Uh, I also would like to thank the speakers, of course, for having shared their knowledge and experience with us. And of course, all, all of you in the audience uh, for, for, for being with us today and uh, for the very interesting discussions in the breakout sessions. We are arriving at the end of the session, but before you go, I would like to remind you that the Daylight Awareness Week is not over yet. Uh, our journey on the trail of sunlight continues tomorrow and it will take us to the wonderful world of cells and molecules. Together with an exciting panel of experts in photobiology, vision science, and chemistry, we will learn about different effects of daylight, this time at the molecular level. For example, how it allows our skin to produce vitamin D, how it can be used for photochemical treatments, particularly in ophthalmology, and finally, how it can power artificial photosynthesis to generate hydrogen. So if you're interested in these topics, you can find further information on the Daylight Academy website and you can still register there. Finally, I would like to inform you about another event, which is this time independent from the Daylight Academy, which is the Daylight Award 2022, uh, the new laureates for the two categories, Daylight Research and Daylight in Architecture will be announced during a ceremony uh, in a few days on May 16, which is the International Day of Light, and it, it will be live streamed. So if you would like to attend the online celebration and listen to the lectures by the winners, go to www.thedaylightaward.com and you will find all information there. So with that, thank you very much again and have a nice evening. <laughs>